Hi, I'm Naomi Murphy and this is the Locked Up Living podcast where we talk with a wide range of people about harsh aspects of institutional life. We also explore some of the ways to overcome them and to grow and develop. I'm David Jones. So join us every Wednesday morning, 6 o'clock UK time for a fresh podcast. So today we're meeting with Dr. Greg Clark, who's performed a variety of roles as a senior clinical psychologist, including clinical lead for a chronic pain service, consultant psychologist and head of psychology within a low secure rehab service. And he was also lead clinical performance psychologist at a Premier League football club. Greg currently works as a consultant clinical psychologist for a college in Oxford, runs an independent clinical psychology service and is the operations director for a healthcare company and models that inform his work are CBT, dialectical behaviour therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and eye movement desensitisation reprocessing. I feel exhausted after reading all that out, Greg, but really delighted to have you on. Thank you very much. And it's, yeah, it's a pleasure to be on. You feel exhausted. That just makes me feel old. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Very nice to meet you. Thanks a lot for coming along. Um, so, so, Greg, you're a clinical psychologist but um you also spent many years working at Southampton Football Club why did you decide to train as a, a clinical psychologist rather than a sports psycho psychologist I was about to say psychotherapist caught up in my nom la couture and then I... okay. um yeah it's a good question um the the, the main reason being is because sport was uh something that i used to do um so i've always been obsessed with sport um playing and and and, and participating and then it just a life experience really i had i had quite a significant injury that meant that i i couldn't pursue any sporting career and that meant that i i went back to school basically um and and got into psychology a meta clinical psychologist so the reason i ended up i i didn't know about sports so you know with sort of 20 20 years ago whatever i didn't know about sport i didn't know about psychology um and i ended up getting into clinical because i worked um in a brain injury unit just as a part time job while i was um I was going to do a, a film studies degree and become the next Tarantino, but but I, I I just got hooked on psychology, so I just pursued that path as a clinical psychologist, um, which was which was challenging but just so um, so exciting. And it was after working as a clinical for about ten years, my my sport head kind of came back in and then I realized that so much of what I was doing as a clinical psychologist was about the mind and behavior and obviously I then wanted to um put that into a sporting context so I kind of went a clinical route and ended up working in sport um I'm sure we'll kind of cover some of this I don't know whether if I had the choice again would I train as a sports psychologist or a clinical um I I think I would still train as a clinical psychologist just because of the breadth of training and um, the nurtured training and, and, and those really kind of intricate skills, supervision and, and how we develop is, is just unbelievable, I think, as, as a training experience. So, yeah, that's that's how I ended up in that oh, path. Oh, that's, that's really interesting. So did you work in the uh, brain injury clinic before? getting to the sports side of things because obviously there's a big issue about brain injury for <laughs> sportsmen and women these yeah. days yeah i i um so this was pre-training so this was once i had qualified once i had a psychology degree um or while i was doing my psychology degree i worked in a brain injury unit just just for just for funds basically um and yeah, fascinating. I mean, neuropsychology was an area I specialized in. And obviously the link between the brain, the body and the psychology is where I, I first started understanding how important the, the, the neural processes are working in brain injury. Um, as you say, that point about how how in the media now we're talking, I, I am so divided. I'm so divided as a neuropsychology with my neuropsychology head on. 
Um, and then obviously with my absolute obsession with football particularly. And I know that a lot, you know, when I was in the Premier League, you know, in the academy setting, there's now, uh, you know, directives about the non-heading of the ball for younger players. Oh, it's a difficult one for me because my neuropsychology colleagues, obviously, and I know the evidence and it's quite clear that there's evidence for it. But I'm also a passionate, passionate um, foot, foot, or not a footballer myself, but passion about football and learning. And I really struggle with this concept of players not learning how to head a ball by not practicing. Um, so it's, but it's, but it's a serious, serious topic. It's, I, I, I also think as well, particularly on that area, that the, the type of balls that are used nowadays in comparison to certainly when I played and, and, you know, sort of 40, 50 years ago, there's a massive difference in the weighting of the ball but yeah it's it's not an area i'm specialized in through avoidance i would say because i possibly don't want to know thank you you've got a rich vein of experience in your background haven't you because you spent some time working in a secure unit earlier on in your career what work did you do there and what skills did you think you gathered whilst you were there that you took on later into your work uh, following on from that yeah <clears throat> I mean work working in forensics and obviously high complex mental health what I learned from that was the beauty of the mind the beauty and the demon of the mind I, I, I would add because individuals that I work with within a forensic setting uh, and particularly where I was working you know we had a high level of paranoid schizophrenia and 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 you know things along along that line and and just what it showed to me was the level of distress that that the 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 mind can cause to people you know and it it also taught me a lot about perception you know what we see is 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 all perception you know I, I remember having sessions with people that you know with with severe visual hallucinations and very very persecutory intrusive thoughts that was just the most disturbing thing I, I had experienced um having not experienced it myself you know I did I I, I like to think I I had a Oh, well, I don't like to think I know I had a very good upbringing um, and, and certainly working with people with psychosis and, and severe mental disorder really highlighted to me how problematic the mind can be for people um, and scary, scary for them. Um, and I think what I learned from that and going forward is I just never make any assumptions about how people see the world. I think I think what we see, and it's hard, I think, for people to get their head around that. But I, I was talking the other day to some friends and just saying in a basic level, what I see in the room not right now and the colours that I see may not be the same colours that you're seeing. So to, to go from that to uh, an idea that somebody can actually see and hear something in the room that no one else can. And, and, and I think that the worst part about that is that they also know for some of them that it's not real. And that's scary as well, that everyone else is then not seeing something that you are. That I think that's a terrifying experience. Well, I suppose we all kind of grow up struggling to believe that what we see and what we do is real. Um, and so to have that kind of threatened when we're older is, is, is quite a thing, I suppose. Absolutely. I think it's nothing worse. I, I think it must be the most scary experience that something's going on in your mind and or, or in the room that no one else sees. You know, we like we are social beings. We like to think that we're all the same at some level. Um, and I think that that's the scary bit for me. Um, and but that for me is the mental health, you know, when when someone steps into a you know, we, we all have mental experiences, you know, but I think when it then falls into that level of disorder and distress, that that that's a real 
Ooh. kind of identity crisis all in one. Hmm. Thank you. So moving on slightly to another area of experience and expertise that you've you've gathered up, because you also worked in pain management, uh, didn't you? Yeah. So, so what did that sort of, I mean, Naomi and I were talking earlier on about how often in our work in prison settings, we found that so many men were dependent upon painkillers. And it was all, it was difficult to know how to manage that. Well, what was your experience like? Incredible. Um, pain, pain and chronic pain for me, I, I absolutely loved working in. And, and because it was fairly early on in my career, it I think it taught me so much of this crossover between physical and emotional. Um, you know, I think we traditionally see pain as a physical, you know, if you ask most people, you know, where's the pain where they'll point to where they can feel it, you know, in a physical sense. And, and certainly for me, what chronic pain showed me was how people who have had trauma, particularly traumas in the past, which is a highly emotional experience, not necessarily a physical trauma, but it can obviously be a psychological trauma, how they then developed, um, you know, chronic pain. And, and, and that, that allowed me to understand that if we treat pain physically, and this was the whole principle of our chronic pain service, you know, I'm under no illusion that our service was set up because of, um, you know, on a medical level, these people were seen as untreatable. Um, you know, and I know that there was a term used at the time, which was medically unexplained symptoms, which I always tongue in cheek used to be amused by because I would say, well, it may not be medically unexplained but it's psychologically explained and i think that we what what we found was that the interventions that we were providing which were on a psychological level and tapping into some of those traumas was then allowing the pain to change and the reason that i use the word change is because it was a perceptual change of the pain on a physical level i don't think the pain went away because we also know that certain, you know, medications for, for, for pain relief were ineffective. You know, they would, somebody would still experience that. So, so it was, it was an exciting time as well, because this was a new concept of psychological treatment for pain, but the effectiveness of a lot of the work we did, and obviously colleagues around the UK and in the U S obviously a big part of, um, a big part of the work John Kabat-Zinn um, was heavily involved with in the US and, and got good outcome from this. I also had my own experience as well that I think is why I became so, so interested in pain because of the injury that I had, um, which was pretty, pretty horrific. I know that it hurt a lot more when it was debilitating in terms of my career and in terms of my social engagement. And what I realized was as I started to grow in a different way and psychologically became accepting of the pain, it definitely didn't hurt as much. So I think that I realized this, this was prior to me learning all about pain and you know mechanisms of pain. So I had my own experience of pain and I managed my own pain psychologically. And I became a bit obsessed with pain as well. So I, 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 I again then, had certain dental procedures done without any pain medication just to show that it is just a perception um i think the dentist was probably more worried than i was about doing it without it but again for me it was that that whole idea that pain is something that we can overcome psychologically but that then transfers into many things within our psychology that we can overcome you know emotional pain social reaction is 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 a kind of emotional uh pain at some level to our ego i guess and that's how i felt i learned most from working within pain services and how that then translated to other conditions that that human beings experience that's so interesting greg because i was I, I was just listening to um 
Bruce Lipton, The Biology of Belief, and he talks about people having surgery without having any pain relief and how people that's able to, that's possible to be done through hypnosis, which mm. obviously for most of us, that sounds like our worst nightmare, but it's really interesting to hear that you, you deliberately put yourself in that position. I was an obsessed psychologist proving a theory, um, which again, ties in with that that in that that concept of the 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 value of why i was doing it you know whereas a lot of people avoid pain you know what 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 fool wants to experience pain were well, the psychologist who wants to learn about it and but for me that that taught me so much experientially as well that i could sit with and i, and I genuinely mean this it wasn't a set i'm not selling it but it didn't hurt it didn't hurt. There were, there were, I turned the dental aspect things. I turned the pain into a physical sensation. And instead of trying to avoid it and every time pain comes up, we get a spike. It was allowing it and waiting and almost like waiting for that rise and fall of pain. And when you, when you put pain into a, almost like a microscope in that way, then it is only a sensation. If you bring and flood the emotional aspect into that experience, it definitely feels overwhelming. Um, so yeah, I did. It was a big part. And again, I always, I also remember when when I had my injury and I had to have a lot of physiotherapy. And at one point, it was really heavy, manipulative stuff in an open wound, and that was excruciating. But I was trying to avoid it. I remember now when I look back, I didn't want that pain. And also that pain meant something really bad to me. Whereas now, I think if you reprocess your interpretation of something, it impacts less. Right. So, well, that's a very powerful thought, <laughs> uh, Craig. But I was thinking what you've been doing really is highlighting the reality of emotional pain as well as physical pain uh, and also I think suggesting there's a connection uh, there but do you think in the main emotional pain gathers less attention less sympathy than physical pain um I don't know if it gets less attention because I, I, I would almost argue mental health is an emotional pain. So our, our mental health services certainly aren't not focusing on that because, you know, my argument would be that's that's emotional pain and, and our mental health services are, you know, currently uh, overwhelmed. I think the problem is it's harder to treat. <laughs> That's, that's a bit of a sweeping statement. But again, medicine works on very physically based, you know, pain in, in that sense. Whereas dealing with emotional pain takes a long, it takes more time, you know. And, and, and again, I would argue and I, you know, I, I'm always uncomfortable with this. And this is why I moved away from working in mental health and psychiatry. We medicate people. You know, we medicate people all the time. And the reason that we medicate, it's controversial, but I'm sure there'll be a lot of people will appreciate this. It's quick. It's easy. You know, I, I remember a few years ago, a friend of mine who was experiencing some difficulties and obviously he went and saw his doctor and I think he had a low level depression. And I, and I obviously said, well, go and see your doctor. You know, you get 12 nice guidelines. You get 12 sessions of CBT and you get some antidepressants. And it was a it was a couple of weeks later he came back and said no 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 I've just been given these drugs to take and he said and they've made me feel horrendous, <laughs> um, you know. And then I said well go along and see your GP explain it and ask about CBT and the CBT waiting list was eighteen months, so basically you have to take your antidepressants to to numb all of your self, and then you wait for the CBT and that's the bit that gets me is I, I'm not anti-medication because I understand that it can be really useful for people but also again working in the pain service I realized how many you know high level opioids people are taking you know and there's there's you know there's in the US there's massive problems in terms of dependency now because we we just seem to prescribe medication 
But my view is, coming back to your point, the reason it's physical pain is treated with medication because it's quick and simple. Our service, you know, for us to treat or help someone with chronic pain, they'd be in our service for three to six months on a weekly basis, going through group work and individual trauma work. That's that's costly. That's very costly. So, and that's not being cynical. That's just a reality. You know, it's a medicine works well. It can be really a, a good quick fix for things. But for me, once things are deeper and emotional pain is clearly a deeper thing. Um, I just wanted, I was going to make a point as well about, about pain. I always, as I say, someone will present with a chronic pain, you know, syndrome. And I would say that 90 to 95% of the people that I worked with within the first session, they've experienced trauma. Um, and there's a lovely study that, that I haven't looked at for a while, but the ACE study, the, the adverse child event, um, you know, there's massive clear evidence on that, that, that anybody experiences early childhood, you know, negative adverse event uh, events have a shorter lifespan, develop cancers, heart problems, you know, all of these physical conditions. So for me, again, it's just a lovely example of how emotional and psychological trauma can can manifest in a physical way that's so interesting isn't it and i think robert scare who did a lot of work a lot of early work on whiplash he found that it's not the accident that that makes a difference in whether t amongst two people whether they develop whiplash injury it's it's actually their history prior to prior to yeah. the accident and the people who've got a history of trauma are much more likely to develop whiplash than people who haven't, even when the crash might have exactly the same, be at the same speed, have the same impact and so on. So it's not the not the physical element of it. Very rarely, very rarely. And we know that on a very simple level. You know, the example I would always use in a group, if you're in a good mood, you know, I, I do this really poor imp impression, but if you're in a good mood and you stub your toe, I, I do a bit of a hop, skip and jump and maybe a silly little, I don't know, noise. If I stub my toe in a bad mood, it's it's like, oh, just another thing that's happening, you know, but, and it hurts more because it's a very different emotional reaction to something. So we know that on a very simple level, if we're happy, you know, and it's the same in sport, there are people that are playing with severe injury, but while you're playing and you're enjoying it, you don't feel it. It's only afterwards. You know, I'd imagine, I'd imagine boxers as well. You know, I, I would imagine they feel the pain after the fight. You know, I don't imagine they feel it during the fight because it's part of the experience. But I, I don't know much about boxing, but I would imagine there's there's pain afterwards. <laughs> there must be. I think it's you, Naomi. Sorry, I missed. That sorry, part. no, no, sorry. Um, you do, see, sorry, I'm just, I'm just thinking of the time, so not wanting to, not wanting to just dwell on, dwell on that. So just trying to skip some questions. So one of the um, models that you, that I know that you, you really enjoy, and that kind of comes through in terms of the example of that you've given already about pain management is acceptance and commitment therapy as the form of treatment can you describe this model of therapy for any listeners that haven't come across it before yeah wow um yeah i'm a bit act obsessed i'm afraid um i again i learned it um 10 15 years ago as part of it so again acceptance and commitment therapy is that the basic premise is you accept the things that you can't change and you commit to the things that you can now on a very you know surface level that seems fairly obvious but the word acceptance is something that you have to do a lot of work with because when we talk about acceptance we're not talking about just accept the situation and resign yourself to the fact that you can't do something what it actually means is in my interpretation it's accepting the experience internally as a whole if i can accept that feeling and that 
urge to respond in an emotional way and I can sit with that and that allows me to commit to something that will move me forward in in what's valuable to me that's that key um skill I guess that we use and that allows us to have this psychological flexibility the thing that gets in the way of us doing that is this and this and the, you know the emotional response to something in sport particularly you see this all the time if if the the feedback that somebody is given by a coach or or a trainer and i think it's quite normal that most human beings response is denial you know i i know when i was younger if i got feedback on something the first thought would be no i didn't i didn't do that um so that's our that's almost like our ego our, our our emotional protective system so for me the reason that we're working with act is or, or why i feel act is, is is effective because we're getting people to change their relationship with whatever the situation is um so so again we talk about fusion within acts we talk about cognitive fusion and that's about how how our thoughts are true you know, I believe I'm a failure, therefore I am a failure. Now, the work I would do with someone who had that belief around being a failure is, well, can we separate from the thought? Can we have a thought that I'm a failure and yet do the actions of something that would bring success? So it's almost like this. And I love behavioral work because, you know, I've, I'm, I'm you know, I've done, I've done a lot of CBT and cognitive therapy and I guess I got to a point, there was, there's a case study that I always talk about, case study, somebody that I worked with for my first good bit of CBT, at least I thought it was good CBT from a therapy point of view. I It was textbook and I did everything right, it was when I was a trainee. And the guy engaged so well and I always remember we did the, the reframing, we did the rebalancing, you know, ratings all went from 100% to 20% and all of that. And then he said to me, he said, um, he said, Greg, I really appreciate all the hard work that you've put in. And it feels like, you know, we've done well, but I still feel effing depressed. And I just remember the heart sink of. But it made me realize because we were doing it on a cognitive level. And that's the bit for me is like you for some people don't get me wrong. CBT is really powerful. I get people to to reframe something. They're like, oh, I'm fine now. I'm off. I'm I'm believing in myself. But I think that comes to that cause probably a bit more resilient. Um, whereas with ACT for me, and I wish I could go back now, obviously 20 years and do that piece of work again, because I don't think we ever got in touch with the feeling. I, I And for me, when people say I feel depressed and it's interesting, we always say we feel depressed when there's, there's an emotional something that we're interpreting as a negative. That's my view is it's a perception that there's something wrong with me. And this is where I struggle a little bit around diagnosis as well, because again, a lot of self-fulfilling element of that comes out when someone tells me that they're the way they are because they're depressed and that depresses me because I'm kind of like, or, or is it the behavior that we're doing? Is it the way we think? And I think what ACT allows us to do is to open that up and start coming to terms with ourselves and being okay with ourselves. And then we can commit to, well, what are the things I want to do in life? What's important to me? And all of this stuff that I've got inside isn't going to stop me achieving that. And then... Once people start achieving and start doing, as we know, the balance comes a little bit better. I don't know if and, that is a good explanation of ACT. <laughs> no, I think, I think you gave a really good explanation of ACT. And I think you, I mean, that also came through really in your discussion about pain earlier, that actually if you accept the pain rather than fight the pain, yeah. that, that it gives you more, it, ironically, it gives you more control over it is what you seem to be. Yeah. saying or makes it less um less painful to yeah to encounter yeah. yeah we really struggle with the word control within act because it's to, because the the control is often the problem that we're trying to control but you're right it's you're you're managing i always use you're kind of maneuvering things in a different mm -hmm. way for your benefit you know so 
is a form of controlling. <laughs> but thank you. I'm going to totally change tack now because I think it would be remiss of us um, to have you here and not be mentioning the fact that you spent a decade working at the Southampton Football Club. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm aware, it's not the norm for elite football clubs to employ clinical psych psychologists. So how did you find yourself working there? And what, what was it that you could do that a sports psychologist wouldn't do or couldn't do? Yeah. Um, how did I end up there? Well, again, going back to, to as I highlight, football's always been my my whole life. I, it is, you know, my wife understands this. It's far more important than anything else. <laughs> um <laughs> So once I had done about 10 years as a clinical psychologist, I loved it. I loved it. I, and I still love being a clinical psychologist. But there was this there was something missing in my life. And I and I just had this realization. I know about the mind. I know how the mind works. I want to be able to explore that within an area that I also love. Um, the reason I got into it again, I, I am someone that will. When I look back, I push, I push myself. So again, the fear that comes in is, goodness me, how do I even get into that? Um, and I literally just spoke to, I knew someone, I think, who knew the kit man um, at, at, at the club. I then got in contact and said, is there a psychologist there? Can you put me in touch? Um and and how it all then worked out, the head of psychology, Malcolm Frame, we we met and we just we just hit it off. We hit it off. You know, the, he's very broad in his understanding of psychology. When I started talking to him about what I do as a clinical, but also the very act based, um, you know, his his principle was all about embodiment and, and that side of thing. We just we just clicked. Um it was a battle. It was a but, but getting into football, I mean, he had been in 10 years before me and resilience, ironically, which is what we use as a concept within sport, is so important for me as a psychologist, forget clinical sport, whatever, as a psychologist working in sport, it's a new area and, and it's tough. I mean, it is tough. Um, uh, again, I always I did some work with a sailing team once, and I always remember one of the guys saying, "You know, when you walk in, they think you're some sort of witch doctor." <laughs> and it was like, "How how do I even start getting into that?" But but it's about resilience. I think also as a clinical psychologist, a lot of training that I did in particular, there was systemic training, so you're understanding the whole system. Um, I think that helped me a lot. I really do, because I had been in situations that were really challenging as a clinical psychologist, again, working in health and hospitals, you know, there there are high demand situations where, you know, for example, we need somebody to have life saving, um, uh, a life saving surgery and they're refusing to based on their beliefs. And you're trying to work with the, the surgeon, the patient, the system. So I think going into football, having that knowledge allowed me to have a, a, a an idea of how the land lied um, or lay even, how the land lays. Um, it didn't make it any easier because what was fascinating for me was I'm a psychologist working in this environment that is the most mind-blowing environment. It really is. Is so unique and everyone says that football's and, and it can't be that different it is unbelievable the pressure you know i said no job i've ever had or most people i know have got a hundred thousand people or plus watching you every week whether you do well or not and then give you abuse if you don't it's it's a really strange and that pressure obviously seeps down um so it took me, it probably took me about eight years to get to where I wanted to work in first team. And I was just, I was privileged enough that, you know, about 18 months ago or two years ago, I was asked to be involved. And 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 it was, yeah, unbelievable experience, but it took a lot. It took a lot. But Southampton Football Club as well, I've said who it is. Um, they were very open. 
that as a club, I don't know how different it is than others. I get feedback that it's hard. It's hard. There was a receptiveness to psychology um, and psychology had been in the building at an ac at academy level for a long time. The first team level hadn't really had a great deal. It had a couple of consultants drop in and, you know, with, with you know, reasonable or no success at times. What was unique for me was I was, I was able to be fully embedded within that first team environment, which, as I say, I've got my psychology head on of seeing all the system, but also I'm being judged now. That that was a that was a big realization that oh everyone's being lovely to me and it's all great but then all of a sudden I'm like this is a very judging environment so I'm constantly being judged um, and but yeah unbelievably unique um, and for me I, I said this someone there somebody the other I felt on fire as a clinical psychologist in terms of having to utilize every ounce of skill and experience i had to survive <laughs> just to survive um but as i say i i was given i was given that opportunity and 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 when it worked and we brought things together you know i was delivering reflective practice you know with groups of players after significant losses and things and again for me it felt really really powerful the work that we were doing um so yeah, could, I, it it was unbelievable. That's all I can say. And obviously, it was something I was so passionate about as well. It was my absolute dream job. But um, but I also had this voice in the back of my mind saying, "Everything's temporary. Everything is temporary in football." And a lot of people I know now who have worked in football talk about that's football. You know, I I saw managers, you know. Um, and players who were who were you know sacked when they were doing all right. You look at the Premier League; it's just you know you get sacked. It's it's just like that. It's easy to get sacked. So, but I felt it was a privilege. So I always again had this acceptance of knowing I'm in this environment. I'm choosing to do this. It's brutal, but I love it. So therefore, I'm prepared to to maneuver it in that way. I think this, there are some parallels. I think with other. A sort of areas in that clinical psychologists are often working in singleton posts aren't they and then you know if it's a, a service that hasn't had much clinical psychology input previously having to find ways to to be accepted and feel and help people see that what you've got to contribute is is a value but i was thinking about what you were saying earlier about the link between trauma and pain for instance and obviously in a in sport if people are suffering injuries which might be a consequence of how, how they're holding their bodies in relation to past trauma or how they're experiencing pain as a consequence of trauma I imagine that as a clinical psychologist you'd be doing something different there to to what a, a sports psychologist might be doing um, but wondered if there are other differences in terms of because th there aren't many clinical psychologists working in in sport so what what would an athlete have got from working with you that they wouldn't have easily found from sports psychology? Mm. I mean, again, I, I don't want to judge sports psychology as a profession because I think the advancement in sports psychology is huge. Um, and, and as a discipline, yeah, the, the, the first to, to develop, improve is, is amazing. I think it's about, I, I would say, and again, I know I've spoken, I've got good sports psychology colleagues and we've always said you know what is the difference I think the word that comes to mind is the depth in which I would go so there's an element to it again there's there's kind of psychological skills training that can be a good, a good example I think is somebody's got a bit of low confidence well let's give them some you know positive you know reflections and give them some of those statements so they're very kind of skills based I think for me, it's kind of like when those things don't work because there's an underlying programming, if we put it that way, that's preventing it even being able to come out. Um, I, I, I used an example. In fact, I had a conversation. I don't think I've said this in this interview. I, I had a, a, a discussion earlier with someone and I said, I remember working with an athlete um, 
and 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 I always remember her saying, well, when I go up to the start line, I'm filling myself with these positive statements. I'm going to do well and I've got this and my past results will indicate. And she said, and then I look to my right and I see one of my opposite, you know, one of my competitors. And I look at them and think, God, they look so much stronger than I do. <laughs> and it's kind of like, that's the bit for me is like, yeah, because your mind will always come with you. So for me, what I'm doing is I'm kind of going, I believe down to that kind of core level. Um, it's not to say one's more effective than the other. And sometimes I will work with athletes and not need to delve because, you know, I, I'm a bit of a believer in as well. We don't have to psych psychoanalyze ourselves to death because I'll always say, well, if we work out why it happened, that doesn't change anything. It might make us feel more validated, but it doesn't mean that our, our, our behavior or output will change. For me, it's kind of like that's where let's change the relationship with, with some of those thoughts and pasts. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of kind of that. <laughs> so earlier on, Craig, you were talking about surviving, um, that it was all about surviving, which connects I think a bit with the notion of fitting in you have to fit in in order to survive but of course when we fit in anywhere we're changing ourselves slightly to fit what we think is or feel or do it do it intuitively you know what what's expected how far does that threaten your professional integrity do you think yeah I, it's 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 the balance that we're always, I think, as as a clinical psychologist, I'm sure every every discipline has their their ethical challenges. Um, again, I think for me, working within sport, and I was very embedded within the medical team and very respectful of that team as a whole, and I think there was a, a mutual respect shared. Um, as a clinical psychologist, I always felt that there was a challenge of our integrity when working in a multidisciplinary team anyway. So again, you know, that that if if I'm working with a patient and the surgeon and the physio and the OT are all wanting to know what the patient is thinking, again, from a confidentiality point of view, I wouldn't disclose that information um but there's still a pressure on it and i and i also know that i've i've led teams before where i've you know i've had managers having serious words with me about well why aren't you why aren't your team playing with the rest of the team you know we all share information so i think i was always used to i don't think it was a battle because i think in the end it was a it was about me being able to say i understand where you're coming from but you know this is what we have to do but I also learned, let's bring everyone into that team. So although somebody might tell me something, and again, if a player tells me something, I would hold that information. But I'm always looking to get them to share that. I'm always looking for someone, you know, because if that's the problem that's getting in the way of something, why can't we talk about that? Why, you know, why, if, if, as an example, if, if the medical team see one thing where, as an example, a player doesn't have any organic reason not to be able to play, why can't we have that discussion? What, and, and a lot of the time what I'll be trying to do is maintaining confidentiality, but trying to empower the individual to say, why don't we talk about this? Because the one thing I know systemically, when the whole team are able to openly reflect on something, without defence, you know, and in an accepting way, you just get a far better outcome. So it, it's, a, it, but it's a constant balance. It's a constant balance. And as I say in football, I'm not saying this happens specifically, but there's a pressure to get someone playing at the weekend. That's the reality of it. So there's no doubt in my mind that one view of a psychologist will be, we'll get the psychologist to manipulate someone <laughs> to be able to play at the weekend. Um and 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 sometimes I I can feel that that there's a pressure, but I think that applies to it. I think the physios, as an example, 
there's a monster pressure on physios to get someone back fit, even though as a physio, you may not feel they're fully ready. But we're talking about a multi-million, billion-pound industry that doesn't have patience. <laughs> but that in itself raises the issue about who is who is the master, because I suppose on the face of it, it will be the multi-million-pound owner, uh, perhaps, who might become impatient with your work. But it might also be the crowd who are howling for your blood because you're not producing the results you know the servant of a number of masters i imagine is that what it mm. felt like i think that's the fascination for me of 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 sport or football particularly it's brutal so again it, it would amuse me and again anyone who works in sport will know what comes out in the media you know some of the things that i saw about why a player isn't playing and you're just kind of like wow that is so far off the mark because actually it can be something very innocent. You know, they, they genuinely have something or a reason. Um, but yeah, the reality of it is, um, what was it? I always remember, and I think it applies really nicely. It was Harry Redknapp, uh, obviously a very famous football manager, said within football, and he talked about the manager, he said the manager has three things that have to be managed. And it's, it's the board, it's the players and it's the fans. And as long as you've got two or three out of those, you probably survive the moment you lose those. So when I look at that, that pressure on a manager, but then the key person within all what we're talking about is the manager because their livelihood depends on having his best available team. And if there's feedback that that player can't play for a reason that doesn't have a really, you know, concrete justification, I can again I can imagine that that will feel a huge amount of pressure from the manager and the manager will then put that pressure down to the rest of the team to make it happen um which again I, I think some of the best people I observed when I was working in the medical team they manage that really well it's again it's about helping the manager understand longevity you know you can play a player today but you know, if something catastrophic goes wrong, then they're out for the rest of the season, as an example. But that's that's what I loved about football. And that's what I love about football is it's just this, this fascinating <laughs> thing with so many different um pressures and but but it all comes from love as well. You know, people want, you know, people, the tribalism behind football fans. You know, they want their team and they want these players to do. They love these players, but they'll also, you know, hate them if it's not working. That's that rawness, that passion of it. So Thanks. fascinating Thanks. as a psychologist and and interesting to manage, I would say. Thanks a lot, Craig. I'm just thinking about the highs and lows that there are at football clubs, and it's perhaps not surprising that so many um, players do end up developing addictions. But what was it? What was it like for support staff like you? How did you manage your own nervous system? It was probably the biggest learning. Le it was the biggest learning for me. Because again, as psychologists, I think we're fairly, it could be a gross uh, generalisation, but I think we're relatively balanced. You know, I, I'm quite, I'm quite a positive outlook in person. Um, I'm, I'm fairly happy. And I'm also a massive believer in work-life balance. And in fact, I go the other way. Life's far more important than work, no doubt. When I was working in, in, in football, that balance went the other way, partly because of the love of the work and how stimulating it is. I mean, as I say, if, if you ask, um, I'm sure if you ask people outside of sport who work, they wouldn't say I'm the hardest working, you know, I'm not, I'm not a 12 hour a day worker. I'm, I, I, I'm all about work efficiently, you know, in in when I was in sport, certainly for the last eighteen months, I was working nonstop. I was I was analysing everything in a sporting concept. I'd watch a game that was nothing to do with our games, but I'd see things in it and go, right, we need to capture that. 
So you become obsessive. I would say that a lot of people working in sport are, are obsessive. And it shocked me that I became that. Um, and it wasn't until afterwards, once I had left, my wife turned around and said to me, and I couldn't believe she said it. She said, for the last three months, it's felt like you haven't really been here which for me was devastating because family is everything, you know, and I, I I pride myself on being present with my family all the time. And it shocked me that it could affect me with someone that's so aware how blind I was. And then if you put that down to, and this is where I always felt for some of the staff, I mean, some of the analysts, they are working. They're unbelievable. They are unbelievable. And I would look and go, God, how must this be affecting? The thing is with it, though, the adrenaline outweigh it. It just keeps everything going. And then you, it was interesting because when you talk about the highs and lows, we went for a period. There were no highs. There were no highs. <laughs> but we maintained a balance. We Now, don't get me wrong. I think at before um, and the more we explored this there was a definite time and I know I walked in at times as this bubbly psychologist trying to keep everyone and you just don't even look at people there was you know when you when you've lost and lost and you're in a relegation battle people can't even look at each other at times I think what we managed to do was to that that changed and I think we got to a point where it was like just stay focused and if you listen to the top you know, the top managers in the Premier League or well, whatever sport, they they hold this focus of it's not about, you know, a win or a loss. It's about maintaining those principles that will get us to where we want to be if we believe in it. But it's like bipolar. It really is. It's a bizarre experience because when you get this high, and I also remember this as well because we did have some highs, I became a bit bored with home life. It was really weird. And it reminded me of, I've worked with someone who was a um, a performer and they had massive drug addiction. And, and again, it was the first time that I really experienced what that was like. Not that I then developed a drug addiction, but it was, the person said to me, I'm so high when I'm on stage. When I come off stage, it's so dull. And I realised again, I was starting to almost fall into that of going, God, this is so boring what people are talking about. But then I realised <laughs> my wife's a beautiful grounder for me because she's not interested in football. I then realised, no, I sound boring because all I'm talking about is this and there's far more to life than just football. And I think for me, that's about that careful balance that we have to take. And I do feel for staff. I think staff within, and I'm only talking about Premier League, but it applies everywhere. You know, my first experience of Christmas fixtures, that players, you know, on Christmas Day, when all their family are meeting to celebrate and have fun, have a drink, eat, they're travelling, you know, six hours to, to Newcastle or whatever. And then... The next day, they're in for recovery. And it's kind of like the normal stuff that people experience in life. So when people talk about sacrifice of elite sport, you know, we talk about money all the time. That's all anyone sees is the riches. The sacrifice that these guys make. You know, I know I enjoyed my life from the age of 16 to 25 because it was all about friends and having fun and being silly the, the the top top athletes they sacrifice all that and and for me that's just that was a massive eye opener so again no wonder there's a need for stimulant you know because when you get those highs and, and I don't know what it's like to play on a premier league pitch but I would imagine I I got to experience the the ripple of it and it was an absolute buzz and there's something about the camaraderie aspect of it as well. It just, even the, the lows bring everyone actually, to, it can push people apart, but it also brings people together. And you end, 
you end up and people talk about this football family you you do you end up with this really strong relationship with people because you're all going through that shared experience um but yeah it's um I think I might have gone off topic. I can't. I, I'm no, you sure. haven't. You haven't at all. But I'm conscious of of the time and not take, yeah, yeah. taking too much of your time. I think that's really fascinating insights. But you can hear um, the, of your kind of like attempt to to hold on to values across work and life. You know the importance of acceptance, but also the importance of making sure your energy is spread across across activities in a balanced way, so that you're your own personal life takes enough of a priority and doesn't yeah. get lost even when you've got a massive passion for the work mm. that you might be doing so it's a really brilliant conversation um really enjoyed talking with you today greg thanks so much yeah yeah i hope it's helpful again it's kind of brought back a lot of thoughts and reflections so no i really appreciate your time thank you great to meet you greg many thanks yeah thank you david you take care